We're joined once again by science journalist Ivan Semenek in this, the second installment of our four-part conversation about the edges of scientific discovery. Tonight, we look at the new use of super telescopes and how they are redefining our view of the universe. Hi again, Ivan. Hello there. Okay, I want to begin with uh, some animation about super telescopes. I want to run this. This is um, of the European Extremely Large Telescope, also known as the EELT project, and I want to run this tape to set up our discussion. Here we go. Okay, Ivan, I know you couldn't see that, but you could hear that dramatic music with the EELT. Tell me about this super telescope. Uh, what makes super telescopes different than regular telescopes? Well, the music really helps uh, build the excitement, <laughs> doesn't it? Um, I, I have to say this is a very exciting project. I mean, one thing we should make clear right away is this fabulous telescope, which uh, you know would be the biggest in the world by a long shot. Uh, has not yet been built, but uh, the European Southern Observatory, which is a consortium of European nations, and now with Brazil as well coming into the picture, uh, you know, th this consortium is uh, trying to move forward on this project and and really uh, basically create the defining machine that would be the you know cosmic discovery machine of, of the 21st century. I've actually looked at the place where this thing is slated to go. Uh, Where's that? Uh, a few years ago, well, a few years, a few years ago, I was down in Chile, which is really a paradise for astronomy. Uh, first of all, it's in the southern hemisphere, so you get uh, some of the best views of the southern sky, which includes the center of our Milky Way galaxy and some other very important locations for astronomy. So it's it's a fabulous uh, position from which to view the sky. The Atacama Desert uh, in northern Chile is the driest place on Earth, literally. So there are very few clouds. You get rainfall maybe a few days a year. The rest of the time it's clear. And the air is very still. It moves across the Pacific Ocean, and it hits that first line of mountains before you get to the Andes Mountains, that first coastal range. And uh, the air is very, very smooth. Uh, before it gets to those mountains and later on it becomes turbulent. So it's the perfect place uh, for looking through the air of Earth's atmosphere to see the universe beyond. Air is, uh, is the big obstacle for astronomers. Uh, even though to us it's transparent, we, we barely know it's there, uh, if you're an astronomer, the motion of the air is constantly distorting the incoming light. Uh, you know, it, it could be full of moisture, which absorbs certain wavelengths of light. So, so that's why that dry, still, clear location is so perfect. And then you have these lovely mountains, these barren mountains sticking up, towering over the Pacific. So I was at, the, uh, at Cerro Paranal, which is the location of the very large telescope. It's actually a group of four telescopes. Probably, you could say it's the most advanced observatory in the world today. And when you stand on the observing deck and you look directly to the east, there's this one mountain that sticks up. You see all of the Andes and so on, but one mountain sticks up above the others. And you can just see it's crying out for a <laughs> telescope. It's, it's just clearly meant to have a, a great observatory. And so it has now been selected as the site, as the future site of the EELT, this European Extremely Large Telescope. Um, what we mean by extremely large in this case is uh, an, a, a collecting surface, a set of mirrors that would be 40 meters across. Uh, you know, the, in the 20th century, the, the sort of the big operating telescope of the middle of the 20th century was the 200-inch telescope in Mount Palomar. Not the biggest one ever, but like that's the one that sort of did the, that was the workhorse telescope in, you know, around the 1950s and 60s and so on. So that's, that's 200 inches. So, so you know, we're, we're, it's, it's a few meters across, but now we're talking, you know, tens of meters across. Uh, and that kind of eye on the sky stands to completely change our understanding of the universe, and it's not the only one. There are others proposed as well that would be of similar size. Well, let me ask you about that. With such a large eye on the sky, what will we be able to see through these super telescopes? 
Well, there are a couple of big challenges that astronomy f astronomers face right now, a couple of big questions, I should say, that really define uh, astronomy. There's been this uh, sense of trying to reach farther and farther back into cosmic history, and it's easy to understand how that works because uh, we know that light, which is our main way of getting information about the universe, light has a finite speed. It takes a certain, a certain amount of time for light to cross space. So if you look at the moon, it takes about a second, a little just over a second for light to reach us from the moon. Now that means, in principle, we are not seeing the moon in the present. Whenever you look up at that lovely moon in the sky, you're seeing the moon as it was one second in the past. Uh, you know, when you look at some of the, the planets, like Jupiter or Saturn, you're seeing them as they were minutes in the past. The stars, we're seeing them as they were years in the past. Now, that stars live for billions of years, so, so those few years don't really make much of a difference, but, but uh, as we go further and further, it does start to make a difference, because the distant galaxies beyond our Milky Way, we're seeing them as they were millions of years ago. And if you can look deeper and deeper and deeper with larger and larger telescopes, you're now looking billions of years into the past and really pushing the boundaries to start to see that period of time when the universe as we know it was taking shape. When, when the matter and, uh, and dark matter and other, other stuff that, that make, made up the early universe was coalescing to form stars and galaxies, you know, it, it's possible that we could look far enough back to see that time. So that's the, that's the goal, to see the formation of the first galaxies, to see the birth of the first stars. That's one, one track that astronomy is on. Another one is much closer. We have another question that astronomers are keen to pursue, which is, uh, are there other planets like hmm. Earth? Are there other places like this that, that uh, you know, might even harbor life? And uh, so there, there's another use for telescopes today, which is to try to find very small, very faint planets orbiting around relatively nearby stars and uh, get a sense of how common this kind of place is in the universe. Now, I clearly remember in the 90s when Hubble was bringing back pictures uh, to us. And now we have the EELT online, or set to come online, as well as the James Webb Telescope, which I understand is a, a project between NASA and the Canadian Space Agency as well. What's really changed since Hubble, Ivan? What, how have we gotten to today? Right, Hubble was a big change. Uh, you know, and, and everyone has heard of the Hubble Space Telescope, and it's hard to understate how important it is. It's not the biggest telescope by any means, but it was the first major telescope to fly in space. So it was the first, you know, I was talking earlier about how the atmosphere is this big obstacle. Uh, that it limits uh, how, how sharply you can see things in the universe. So the Hubble was the first telescope to really get beyond that, and, uh, and the clarity with which it was able to perceive the heavens uh, really changed our, our perception in some very significant ways. So it was almost a, a leap like Galileo's telescope, you know? It was, it was really seeing the universe through a new eye. Um, it also changed the practice, practice of astronomy in an interesting way because the Hubble was only one telescope and it's an orbit around the Earth and, and time on the Hubble, especially in, in sort of the first part of its time, was very limited. Uh, astronomers had to really compete to have any amount of observing time and decide what to look at with the Hubble. So, so you can't have the Hubble doing everything and you can't have it staring at you know, one particular object for long periods of time. It, it had to distribute its, its work. So this kind of give and take then emerged where you would have a telescope like the Hubble, which is up in space and can pinpoint things, but then on the ground you have this kind of supporting armada of large telescopes you know, and sort of in the 1990s and into the first decade of the 21st century, the, the, the major telescopes would be on the order of 8 or 10 meters across, like the, the Keck telescopes in Mauna Kea or the Gemini telescope, which Canada uh, is, is a member of. Uh, and, and there are also similar sized telescopes in Chile. So these telescopes were sort of complementing what the Hubble could do. And major discoveries have been made as a result of this kind of combination of space-based observing and ground-based observing. So what we're seeing now is the next iteration of that. So the Hubble is getting close to the end of its life. It's mm. been extended, uh, but it's, it's definitely in the, it's getting into its sunset years now. 
So the James Webb Space Telescope is a much larger space telescope. It's a very different kind of space telescope, but it is essentially the successor to the Hubble. So it will launch and it will take over in space. Meanwhile, there's this need for a next generation of telescopes on the ground that can also support the kinds of things that the James Webb will do, that kind of penetrating deep view of the cosmos. So that's where the EELT comes in, and also two other projects that are kind of North American-led. One is the TMT, or 30-meter telescope, which is exactly... They've got all exotic names, telescope. don't they? Oh, exactly. <laughs> you, in the future, they may have... Uh, you know, I suppose it would just take one very wealthy benefactor, <laughs> you know, to come up with a billion dollars, and then, you know, they could name the telescope which is basically, you know, like the Keck telescope, for example. But uh, anyway, at the moment, it's the TMT, which is a 30-meter telescope. There's also the GMT, the Giant Magellan Telescope, a different kind of approach, but basically the same idea, to have the collecting surface of a telescope that's more like tens of meters across rather than a few meters across, and, uh, and just really ramp up the amount of light that can come in. And, and when you have a larger telescope, it means that you can see fainter and you can see farther, and that's the bottom line. Let me ask you a question that critics might be asking. They might be saying, you know, these super telescopes are great for science junkies, if you will, but for the person who just has a passive interest uh, in these kinds of things, in space exploration, what do you say to them? What, what can they hope to gain from in investments in, in super telescopes? Well, it's important to put it in perspective. So let's, um, astronomy is a small amount of the world's total expenditure on science. Uh, you know, and I'm not saying this as sort of an astronomy advocate, I'm just sort of laying it out like it is. So uh, if one of these telescopes costs a billion dollars, that's a lot of money. But on the other hand, that's the amount that's spent, you know, like that, that's a small fraction of the amount spent every year, for example, uh, by the National Institutes of Health here in Washington, you know, the largest research organization. We still spend far more on biomedical research, obviously, uh, which has a lot of practical applications to human life. So astronomy is curiosity-based. It's a different, you know, it's pure science. It's science that's just simply in pursuit of knowledge, although I think many would say that it has delivered, uh, um, it has delivered in an important uh, facet to human understanding. It helps, it, it answers some of those basic questions that we have about where are we? You know, what is this existence that we find ourselves in? What can we learn about it? And also there's this deeper question about are there others like us out there? So, you know, these are things that fall within the domain of astronomy. It is certainly hard to package that as important, practical, you know, we'll build a better mousetrap kind of science. Although, there is this other, uh, one other uh, thread to this, which is that many people who uh, are brought into science, many younger people who are inspired by science and go on to make important discoveries in all branches of science, often are first inspired by astronomy. It's one of those areas that, that is, uh, uh, because it gets at those questions that people often have when they're, when they're in their adolescent years, just kind of wondering about, you know, what's out there? And, and people really do find it, uh, it's, it's a science that people relate to perhaps more than some others. Okay, Ivan, we have about two minutes left, and obviously you're sitting in front of the Capitol building there, but you are originally from Amherstburg, Ontario, which uh, is near Windsor, as I understand it. So I want to ask you about ca right. Canada's role. Where does Canada fit in uh, to all of this, and what does it need to be doing differently, if anything? Canada is a small country, so it, it's, it's now beyond one country to build something like the EELT or the TMT. Canada has to decide which of these projects it wants to be a member of. Uh, it's been considering membership in the TMT. Maybe uh, th there will be other options in the future. So that's where the astronomical community is at. But if Canada wants to contribute, and I think most uh, countries are in this situation, they have to decide how do they become part of one of these larger projects because we're no longer in a place where we're going to have hundreds of big telescopes around the world or dozens, we're going to have two or three major telescopes and those are going to be the, the cutting edge machines of the future. Okay, Ivan, we'll have to leave it there for tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you.